I think what we'll do tonight is we're going to talk about uh, the Psalms and the prophets. I know Chris did tell me he touched on the Psalms when he taught, but he told me he only did like 10 or 15 minutes. So I want to give you a few more tips for interpreting the Psalms because they're a unique kind of literature in the scriptures. And most of you will probably spend a lot of time reading Psalms in your devotional life. So it's good to learn to read those well. And then we want to spend some time talking about the prophets. Uh, in fact, I think we're going to start with the prophets and then go to the Psalms afterwards. I think we'll do that. So, um, well, why don't we begin with a word of prayer? Lord, thank you for this time we can come together this evening. And uh, we're thankful for our church and for the life that you've given us in Christ. We pray, Lord, that we would be pretty committed to making quality disciples that love you and advance your purposes. We pray, Lord, that courses like this would help that goal, that we would increasingly understand scripture, be able to apply scripture. We thank you that the whole Bible from beginning to end is relevant. Help us not to make the mistake of throwing out the first 39 books, but to get into them and understand them and to be blessed by them because you provided them to humanity. Guide my discussion tonight with this class in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So prophets. Okay, first of all, what do you think of when you think of prophecy? Don't overthink it. I just want you like the first words that come to your mind. It's a message. It's a message. Message from the Lord. Message from the Lord. Usually about the future. Was that you, Kelly? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Revelation. Revelation. What else? Sorry? Men of God. Men of God. Yeah. Always come to pass. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Pardon me? Meaning? Um, whenever I've heard of prophecy, it's always prophecies about the person of prophecy of Jesus. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Good. Yeah, so it sounds like you put some thought into this already. So let me, um, let me give you two words. You probably have heard of these before. But when we think of prophecy, most people, Kelly gave us a similar word, think of foretelling. Okay? What does that word mean? What does it mean to foretell? Sorry? Okay, so speaking of the future. future. Now, this is pretty common. People think prophecy, future, prophecy, future, prophecy, future, prophecy, future. We speak that way so much that almost all believers coming to the church think that prophecy is about the future. But it's not. Just read the prophets. It's not true. There are elements of this in the prophets, and there are plenty of elements, but there's actually not very much of this in the prophets. What is there in the prophets? I'll give you a similar word. Go ahead. Like a course correcting of like bringing Israel back to righteousness rather than unrighteousness. Awesome. That's good. Course correcting. That's, that's a good word. So the word we use just to kind of help us to remember it is forth telling. Forth telling. So just read the prophets. And you will discover time and time and time again, they are, to use Rich's words, correcting the course, telling forth the word of God, reminding people what God has already said, if you were to pick an occupation, just a secular occupation, that is a lot like the role of an old covenant prophet, what occupation would you pick? A counselor, a counselor? okay. Too soft. Yeah. <laughs> Police. Too kind. Police. Right on. Police. 
if you read Isaiah, Ezekiel, Micah, Zephaniah, pick your favorite prophet. They are spending the vast majority of their time policing the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Over and over and over again. Like Most of it. I don't want to put a percentage on it, but way, way over half, way, way over three quarters of most prophetic books are foretelling. And only a small portion is actually foretelling. So we'll get to that in a moment. But I want to drive this home. We need to kind of correct our understanding of this word. These were God's policemen sent to call people back to fidelity, faithfulness to what God had already said through Moses and through, the, um, through Abraham, through the early patriarchs and so forth. So what prophecy is not is just foretelling. What prophecy is, is foretelling. Now, although the prophets did announce the future, they were primarily, who, who was their primary audience? Because think about this. In the prophetic utterances, they're clearly about the future. They're rarely about next week. They're usually about 70 years from now, or 100 years from now, or 500 years from now. Therefore, if they're prophesying just about the future, most of what they're prophesying about relates to people that have not yet been born. <coughs> you following me on this? Mm -hmm. So they're, when they do this, their audience, with, with many exceptions, but for the most part, are people that are not yet born. But in foretelling, they're speaking to the people who currently are alive. They're speaking to their contemporaries. So when you read the prophets, you'll notice there's a heavy emphasis on communicating to their contemporaries in the moment. Here's what you guys need to be reminded of because clearly you've forgotten. So prophecy is unique in that the prophets, now th this is the difference between a prophet and a preacher. And especially in the modern church, we like to blend these words. You know, you're very prophetic and you're preaching. And yada, yada, yada. Okay, I get it. But prophecy is unique in that prophets don't just simply claim to speak about God. That's what I do on Sundays. I claim to speak about God. But prophets claim to speak for God. They claim to speak for God. They claim to have been given divine revelation from God, and therefore when they open their mouths, what they say is binding to the people of God. I don't do that. When I open the Bible and preach, or you open the Bible and you preach, yeah, you're using your words, but you're taking people back to the scripture. You're looking up, you're commenting, you're expositing, you're taking people back to the scripture. You're looking up, you're commenting, you're expositing, you're taking people back to the scripture. But the prophets have a heightened responsibility. So in the narrative books, what are some of the narrative books? Of the Old Testament? What, what is narrative, by the way? What's another word for narrative? Story. Story, but it's not fiction. Genesis. Okay, so Genesis is narrative. Exodus. Pardon me? Exodus. Exodus has narrative in it. It's when, Ruth, when there's a narration of a, an event, a story, an episode. Sometimes it's better to use the word account than story. Because story can sound fictional. But an account doesn't sound fictional. It sounds real. So we got to be kind of careful there. I try to be careful when I preach to use the word account, not story. But you catch my drift. In the narrative books, we often hear about the prophets. But in the prophetic books, we hear from them. Now, here's the arrangement of the prophetic books in the Bible. Now, if you were to pick up, I have an English Bible here. It happens to be the ESV. 
big Bible. That's why I don't preach from this, because my arm would get sore. <laughs> preach from a small Bible. But this is a study Bible, and it's good for studying. But if you look at the first 39 books, in the English Bible, you, most of you probably know the order. But that's not the, or if you open a Hebrew Bible, that's not the order. It's not the same order of books. All the books are there, but it's a different order. So in the, old te in the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish order div divides this into, okay, we'll discard that one, into the former prophets and the latter prophets. Here's the list under the former. You're going to be surprised by this. Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. You're like, those are prophetic books? I thought those were narrative. We'll get to it in a minute. The latter prophets include Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then Hosea right through to Malachi. We call those the minor prophets just because they're shorter, not because their message is less. So major prophets are big prophetic books like Ezekiel, it's a lot of chapters. Isaiah, a lot of chapters. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nehemiah, Habakkuk. Kind of small, right? These are small chapters. They're sm small, small books. So all of those, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and all the minor prophets fit into this. Under this fit Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, under here. Now, the English order, the way we divide up the English order is we have the major prophets first. So you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Kind of in order of longest to shortest, more or less. Then you have the minor prophets, Hosea to Malachi or if you're Italian, Malachi, right, exactly. So the question is, why then did the Jews consider books that we call historical, like we think of the historical books as Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, because they're recording the history of Israel. Why did the Jews put those under this category and consider them prophecy. Let's talk about that. We need, to, we need to start with, I'm going to give you a couple headings, the role of the prophet and the nature of the prophetic message. So the role of the prophet and the nature of the prophetic message. And this will help us to arrive at a more biblical understanding of prophets as the old covenant people and Jesus would have understood prophet. So we're talking about the role of the prophet, first of all. What is his or her job? The role of the prophet was to communicate or speak a message from God to his, I'm going to surprise you, or her contemporaries. And so we have two different kinds of prophets in the Old Covenant. This is pretty technical stuff. You ready for this? The writing prophets and the non-writing prophets. You guys can handle that? It's pretty technical and deep, right? So pretty fancy language. Theologians you think are so profound, but really not true. Just kind of simple. The writing prophets. The writing prophets were the prophets for whom we have a record primarily of what they said, not everything. So what would be some prophets that we have a record of what they said? We have, we have their sermons. Let's give me a couple examples. Isaiah. Isaiah. We have a record of what Isaiah said. Give me another one from the minor prophets. Pick a minor prophet. Isaiah. Amos. Oh, Amos. Okay, so... If you're looking at all those books that we call prophetic books, from Isaiah right through to Malachi, 
we have a record of what they said. How many of you have read the book of Elijah? Nobody? Because it doesn't exist. How many of you read the book of Elisha? Doesn't exist. But they were prophets, were they not? They're the non-writing prophets. Their lives and some of the things they said are described in narrative forms in what we call the historical books. Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. But we don't actually have a record of their quote-unquote sermons. How about Samuel? Samuel was a prophetic figure in Israel, but and while we have 1st and 2nd Samuel, they're not records of his sermons. They're, they're narratives of what was going on in Israel at the time. So the non-writing prophets are the prophets where, for whom we have a record primarily of what they did. So very simply, writing prophets, we have a record of what they said. Non-writing prophets, we have a record of what they did. We have a record of their accomplishments. So when you're, if you describe your Bible and you, um, let's just go to, let's go to Hosea, okay? Because that's a, kind of the first one out of the minor prophets. Now, Hosea is a pretty, pretty incredible book. I, I've just really enjoyed studying that over the years. And uh, it was one of the first books that I taught through to my youth group at Campbell Baptist when I moved to Windsor in like 1996. And I just, wow, this is a great book. And I've, I've since preached sections out of it. I did a, um, a sermon series on the first three chapters here called God's Astonishing Love, I don't know, a year or two ago. It's just a great book. It's, I'd just say it's like the Old Testament equivalent of the Gospel of John, especially the first few chapters. Hosea 3 is essentially like John 3 in a narrative storm if you, uh, form if you understand the message of it. It's the Gospel in the Old Testament. So... You can read about Hosea, his adulterous wife, the three kids that are born from that union and what they represent. Then you get to chapter three, and this is the big reconciliation chapter with his wife. And then you get into several chapters where he, on behalf of the Lord, let's just look at some of the English headings here. Chapter four, the Lord accuses Israel. That's a sermon. Punishment coming for Israel and Judah. Another sermon. You just kind of flip through. It's just sermon after sermon after sermon, right? But what we don't get in this book is any sense of how Israel responds to it. There's no side story of repentance and people pushing back or receiving what he has Whereas in, in, in 1 and 2 Samuel, you do. You see that the prophetic figure moving through Israel and it cuts out and talks about David and cuts over here and talks about Saul. And you see all these different episodes and people responding or not responding to whatever it is that Samuel has called them to do. It's a narrative. But in Hosea, it's like, I, I kind of wonder, how did the people respond? I don't know. We're not told. It's like a timeless sermon. And that is true of most of the prophets, especially the minor prophets. They're sermons without narrative. You, you don't know. In fact, for some of them, you don't really even know what the circumstances were. Like, what were people doing that caused Obadiah to flip out and warn and confront? And you don't know. So it's a different kind of literature with Elijah and Elisha. You know their story. How many of you know like the, the, the biography of Obadiah? I don't know. You know, you, you, you get snippets of where he might be from or whether he's northern or southern prophet. And, you know, there's indicators from history or within the book when he might have written. And you kind of might know based upon the historical books what was going on then. But you don't really know a lot about these people. But when you read about the non-writing prophets, you do. So, due to the fact that much about the non-writing prophets 
is contained in the historical books, the Jews considered these books prophetic. That's why they put them under the list of the latter prophets. They're not, they're not really books that are all prophetic, but because that's the only place you can find out about the non-writing prophets, they put them under that heading. So where the historical books are usually narrative, and they do communicate in narrative form, the, do you, do you all know the word genre? Do you know what that means? It's like a style of literature. So in contemporary writing, just, just so we're all tracking here, what would be a couple genres of literature that you may have encountered this week? History. Maybe you read a little bit of a mystery book. What Action. else? Sorry? Action. Um, usually that would be like within a narrative or something like that. Okay, science fiction, poetry, poetry. Satire. satire, technical journals, emails, tweets. These are like new genres, literally genres of communication. And in the Bible, we have different genres. So just, just to give you like an extreme example, that will be super helpful for you if you get a love letter from someone, hopefully your spouse or your <laughs> child or something. If you get a love letter, you will intuitively read that differently than you will read a math textbook. And you may not even understand the different principles you're employing, but you'll read it differently on, and, and, and on many levels. And in the same way, you can't read the Bible flat. You can't read Revelation like you read Matthew. You can't read Matthew like you read Joel. You can't read Joel like you read Genesis. It's a different genre. So you, you, you have to adjust and you employ, hopefully you're conscious of them, you employ different approaches to studying different genre of literature. So one of the things, because we're talking about prophecy tonight, when you're studying the former prophets, you read them using the techniques you do to read narrative. When you're studying the writing prophets, you have to learn to read, write this word down, oracles. Now an oracle, just to define this, is generally a poetic, spoken, complete message addressing a particular issue. So it's like a sermon. So what I say when I preach, okay, this, so this is my mindset. Those of you that preach or teach, this might be helpful. Or even if you just listen, this might be helpful. So um, pardon the analogy if, if you're like totally opposed to weaponry. But I think it's more appropriate for me to preach with a shotgun than a sniper's rifle. So what I mean by that is I want to preach to everybody. Now, what we used to call it a bully pulpit. A bully pulpit is where a preacher bullies people from the pulpit, and he has an agenda, and he wants Jack to hear it because Jack offended him that week. Or whatever, Susie mouthed off. So he crafts his sermon, hoping that Jack or Susie hear it, and maybe everyone else benefits. That's called a bully pulpit. It's kind of abusive, actually, I think. It's an abuse of the preaching office. Because those, those kinds of uh, confrontations are to be done one-on-one. -on -one. Okay? So if I have a problem with Jack or Susie, I'm supposed to deal with those separately. I don't get up and use my preaching time to attack Jack. Now, it is amazing people that are under conviction sometimes think you wrote the sermon for them. <laughs> and that's okay. You should kind of receive it as if you got hit with a sniper's bullet. But in, through mature eyes, you should realize you actually got fired on with a shotgun, maybe some buckshot in it or something like that, right? In, um, in the prophetic books, they do preach like snipers. 
And what I mean by that is they identify specific particular issues and they address those as if the Lord was speaking directly to the audience, generally, not always, but generally to some sort of a failure. Okay, generally to some sort of a failure. I'm going to just kind of come back to that in a little bit. So we're kind of drifting now into the prophetic message. A little bit about the role. Now let's talk about the prophetic message. So over the overarching idea here is that the message is an enforcement message. It's designed to enforce Torah law. So when God spoke to Moses from Genesis through Deuteronomy, the words that he gave were foundational to everything else you read in the Bible. That's why Jesus quotes from the Torah so much. It's foundational. And so the, 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 the uh, for example, um, God's covenantal promises are communicated there. And one thing that you discover in the prophets, are you familiar with the biblical concept of blessings and cursings? So under the old covenant, God speaks some sort of a law, a stipulation, a requirement, a rule, a regulation. And then almost always he goes to a blessing or a curse. You notice that? If you do this, he spells out the blessings. If you don't do it, here's the curse. We're going to look at the curse passage momentarily. But the prophets never invent new blessings or new curses. If you read them, they don't invent new blessings and new curses. They always go back to the Torah. And they just extract from the Torah the blessings and cursings that God has already pronounced under the old covenant. And I would argue that New Covenant prophets did the same thing. They just extract blessings and cursings. Now they're more New Testament-ish in their orientation, but they don't derive them just out of thin air. So here are some curse passages. Uh, Leviticus 26, verses 14 to 39. Leviticus 26, 14 to 39. Just skim this. But if, that's a conditional clause, if introduces a conditional clause, if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, if you spurn my statutes and if your soul abhors my rules, so that you do not do all my commandments, but break my covenant. There's the if. Here's the then. If then. Then I will do this to you. I will visit you with panic. Hmm. I'm having a panic attack. Maybe it's because you're sinning. With wasting disease and fever. Oh, physical problems. Uh, I will consume the eyes and make the heart ache. You'll sow your seed in vain. I'm out here sowing all these, this corn. Why is it not coming up? Maybe because you're living in sin. And you can just go through it. There's all kinds of things here. Look at verse 23. And if by this discipline you were not turned to me, but walk contrary to me. So that says God's discipline is always for what purpose? Right. To turn us back. Never just to be mean. Just want to be mean. I love being mean. I like, I'm, I like making you suffer. That's not God. But he'll punish you to turn you back. Then I will walk contrary to you in fury. And I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins and so forth. And it gets pretty crass. So that's one discipline passage. There's another one in Deuteronomy 4. There's kind of like three major discipline passages in the Torah, 15 to 28. Verse 
Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, out of the midst of the fire. Beware, lest you act corruptly in making a carved image for yourself. Isn't that interesting? That's very interesting. As God speaks out against idolatry, which he often does, and one of the things he always ridicules idolaters for is that you've created these little shapes that are supposed to be God. Why doesn't God reveal himself in a form? Because he doesn't want us to think that he's of the physical order. And so he says here, Since you saw no form on the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, it's like this is a positive thing. This is a proof that God is God, that he didn't reveal himself so you could see him, touch him, smell him, hear him. Beware lest you act corruptly by making carved images for yourself in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, and so forth and so on. And then if you go right down to verse um, 28, there's a lot of different references to God's anger. Verse 23, take care lest you forget the covenant. Um... Verse 24, this is a well-known verse, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Oh, God's allowed to be jealous? Yeah. Oh, I get to be jealous then. No. Hmm. But God is jealous for his own. God's on a different standard than us, so he's allowed to ask for your attention. He's allowed to be jealous. He's allowed to seek glory for himself because he's God. We're not allowed to do that, but he's God, so he's on a different level. So that's a passage. And then there's one more in chapter 28. Same book. Fifteen to thirty-two. And it's always if then, if then. But if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all the commandments and statutes I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall be this, your city, your field, your basket, your kneading bowl, the fruit of your womb, the fruit of the ground, the increase of your herds. Everything will be cursed by God. So those are the cursing passages. I'm going to give you them in a preachable format. You like that? Like preachable formats? Okay, here they are. Curses include death, disease, drought, Disaster, destruction, defeat, deportation, destitution, and disgrace. That's a lot. Make for a good sermon outline. I wouldn't preach that. You never want to preach a 10-point sermon, but um, you could maybe mention them. And then we have blessing passages. So two of the blessing passages come right before the cursed passages in Deuteronomy. So you go back to chapter 4, you go to 28. So being that we're in 28, just look back up a little bit. And it says, verse 1, If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, be careful to do all his commandments that I commanded you today. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. You'll be blessed in the city, the field, the fruit of the womb, the ground, the flock your basket, your kneading bowl, lots of blessings. Other nations will be scared to death of you. They'll run from you. These are all God's blessings. And then we have Deuteronomy 4, 32 to 40. And then we'll go back to, let's just go back to Leviticus 26. Blessings for obedience. Don't make any idols. Don't erect an image or a pillar that you may not set up a figured stone in your field and bow down to it. So it's not talking about, like, I don't know, not having a stone bird bath in your backyard or something like that. It's talking about things that you would make to worship. It's not against craftsmanship of objects. So all these peace for the land, again, bread for the bowl, How about verse 11? I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. That sounds a lot like 
what was lost in Genesis chapter 3. So, blessings and cursings, blessings and cursings, blessings and cursings. Blessings include, sorry, I don't have them all starting with the same letter here, but life, health, <laughs> prosperity, good harvests, respect, and safety. And all of these blessings and curses are very commonly alluded to in the prophetic books. If you don't do this, the Lord's going to shrink your land. If you don't do this, you can forget about having a good harvest. If you don't do this, then forget about fertility. These are all blessings and cursings. And the prophets spend a lot of words threatening and encouraging based upon the curses and the blessings of God. Just read them. So this is a little bit of an interpretive key for you. When you're reading prophetic books, just look for them. Underline blessings, cursings, blessings, cursings, blessings, cursings. They come up time and time and time again. And like the if then, the if then formula. That's very common. If this, if you do, if you do this, this is gonna happen. If you don't do this, this is gonna happen. If then, if then, if then, if then. They're all very situational. And that's why the prophets are actually very preachable, because because we're not given all like the deep, the narrative details of the, the situations they were dealing with, it's easy to take many of the prophetic books and apply them to similar modern type circumstances. When the people of God are, have become materialistic or they're not holding in high regard God's word or they're seeking their own pleasure or whatever. Those cursed prophecies work really well. They're preachable. Likewise, and the people of God are being s sacrificial for the Lord and they're experiencing persecution and they're wondering like, does, does God still, is he paying any attention to this? Those blessing passages are really good to preach as well. But what do you have to change when you preach old covenant prophecies into new covenant circumstances? What do you have to change if you're preaching it? Right on. So you can't say to people, like, this, this is where health, wealth, and prosperity preachers don't make the dispensational leap. So the old covenant is super awesome, but it's different than the new covenant. And under the new covenant, you are not promised babies because you've been faithful. You are not promised money because you've been faithful. You are not promised harvests because you've been faithful. You're not promised agrarian, physical, tangible, I can grab it, I can see it, I can taste it stuff. This is the mistake that health, wealth, and prosperity preachers make because those things are not, pro read the New Testament, they're not promised under the new covenant. They're just not. Our promises, blessings, and cursings are more spiritual in, in nature. So what would be some New Testament, let's start with blessings, start in a positive. What are some New Testament blessings found in the New Testament? Just broad strokes here, folks. Fruit of the Spirit. Okay, fruit of the Spirit. Peace. 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 Eternal life. Eternal life. Jesus as your Savior. <clears throat> Sorry? Eternal life. Eternal life with the Lord. What else? Adoption. Okay, adoption as sons. <coughs> Peace that, maybe someone already said that. Peace that passes understanding. Hope. Hope. Okay, these are awesome. How about curses? Eternal damnation. Eternal damnation, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> kind of a biggie. Yep. Excommunication from the church. Disfellowship from the people of God. You get it. They're different. They're just different. Think more agrarian, earthy, old covenant, more heavenly, spiritually oriented, new covenant. So you can preach. There's no problem. You can preach the Old Testament prophets. But when you preach them, you have to 
make those adjustments into the new. Did you have a question or a comment? Okay. You have to make those adjustments into the new covenant context in order to help people to benefit from them. So it's good to actually teach people stuff like this. Um, people like to um, sometimes like uh, cut and paste Old Testament promises and because they sound nice. Some of them just sound really nice and they just kind of cut and paste them into the New Testament and they're just not really like super accurate. What would be some examples of that? Ruth and Naomi, your people would be my people, my people, your people, and blah. your God would be my God. And everyone likes that at like weddings, right? But it's actually two women having a conversation. It's kind of weird to make that a wedding passage. And um, it relates to those physical covenantal promises of inclusion in a nation under God. Uh, what's the other one, um, Jeremiah 29? Yeah, so give me that one. Yeah. Yeah. Future hope. It's not all coming to me right now, but you know it. Um, so there's nothing in there that's explicitly and exclusively old covenant, but in the head of the original reader, the interpretation would be different then it should be in your head. So when you think of prosper, we, we shouldn't be as scared of the word prosper, but we tend to shy away from it because health, wealth, and prosperity preachers have preached it like material prosperity, material prosperity, material prosperity. It's okay to say, if you follow the Lord, you're gonna prosper, but again, you, have to, you don't wanna miscommunicate to people. This is a, let me just make this little sidebar, okay? A little, little sermonette here. When you call people to surrender themselves to Jesus, oftentimes the people that are most likely to listen are people who are in crisis. So I'm, I'm on my deathbed. I like my body's ways, but I'm dying and I kind of want to be healed. Or the love of my life just left me, just went through a divorce. Or my kids are all like maniacs. Or... I have like no money. So the people in crisis, right? This is why Jesus says it's, it's easier, uh, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Because people that have it together, they're not really all that generally interested in listening. But people in crisis are interested, more interested in listening. But what you have to be careful is not to communicate to them that if you come to Jesus, all of those temporal problems are going to be being fixed. So you have to be very careful about that. Now, in a sense, the word fixed isn't great, but in a sense, they're going to be fixed, but eschatologically. And in the meanwhile, you get gifts of peace and hope and comfort and joy and perspective and all that, which are wonderful, but you just have to be careful. That, uh, I mean, I can think of people that I led to Christ, thinking of a guy that was a, in jail, alcoholic, and you watch, and a year or two in, they're no longer around. You pursue, you pursue, you pursue. They're, they're, they're not around. Why? Because, well, their alcohol problem is behind them now, so that's been fixed. Thank you very much, Jesus. And it's back to the old way of life. Before long, they're back into that stuff because they, they didn't understand what it was that Jesus was offering. So we need to be careful about that. Having said all of that, having said all of that, proverbially, okay, proverbially, if you do what God has asked you to do, don't be surprised that life is a little bit better in the here and now. So if you conduct yourself in relationships with people the way you're supposed to, don't be surprised you're going to have better relationships. If you handle your money the way God has asked us to handle our money, don't be surprised you're a few steps ahead of your neighbor who makes the same amount and never seems to have anything. So don't be surprised that there's, you know, there, there are physical payoffs to following God's plans. But at the same time, godly people die poor. Godly people have died on the stake. You know, godly people have been ridiculed to death. They're godly people. 
and uh, we need so we're, it's not guaranteed. Now, the how do you like how do you how do you determine who's a prophet, who's not? So this is a big question. So who who qualifies? So let's start with the old covenant and. I'll give you some passages. You can jot these down. God is very clear in the scriptures that he raises up prophets. So Jeremiah chapter one, verses four to five. Hosea one, one to two. Amos seven, 14 to 16. Those are examples. We'll just go to one since we've already been to Hosea. Let's go back there. I kind of would like you to be familiar with that book. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Barry. And then we get the timing in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So we know when he served the Lord because we know you, just, you would just research this. When did these kings of Judah reign? When did this king of Israel reign? Okay, that's, that's the time period for Hosea. And the word of the Lord came to him. And then verse 2, and the Lord first spoke through Hosea. The Lord said to Hosea. So we're not going to go any further. That's all we need. That the old covenant prophets are framed up in the scriptures, have been raised up by God. So this is why when you read their sermons, call them their sermons, phrases like, I'll just use the old language, thus saith the Lord, <laughs> or thus says the Lord, come up numerous times when, and, and in fact, um, let's, go to, let's go to Isaiah. This is an interesting example. Uh, first chapter. Isaiah 1. So the ver first verse is like the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, and then the timing. Look at the second part of verse 2. What, what strikes you about that? So picture Isaiah with his scroll and his pen in his hand, and he's writing this. Picture it. What's interesting about the words he actually uses? Exactly. Did you hear that? He's writing in the perspective of God. He's using the first person personal pronouns. Children, I have, have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. It's like he's God's conduit. So his words are God's words, or God's words are his words. So there's a strong sense that the prophets are speaking on behalf of God, and not just about God, but they're speaking on behalf of God. You would have, like, you would jump up in church, yell and holler and probably beat me or pull me off the stage if I started talking to you, like, using the first person pronoun as if I was God. That'd be weird, unless I'm, like, quoting something. I don't even know how I would do that, because I've never done that. But Isaiah and others would feel quite comfortable doing that. And then God's word empowered the prophet. So back to Hosea. Chapter four. Verse two. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of a land. There's no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God, God in a land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, committing adultery. 
They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. And he, he, he kind of, now the reason why I'm starting here is because chapter one, two, and three is kind of like the setup for Hosea's actions in his life and the three kids and all that kind of stuff and the big reconciliation scene. And you think, man, this guy, like if I was this guy, I would like resign immediately. But it's like the guy's balloon is not deflated. He's like energized by the word of God. So that there's, there's energy in chapter four and following as he comes out of the gates. And where does that come from? The word of the Lord, verse one, hear the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord has empowered him in order to bring those words of judgment upon the people of God. So it's super easy to determine who the old covenant prophets were. Not super easy to determine who modern day prophets are. And um, certainly not a self appointment. I, I personally am not convinced that in the New Testament, when it speaks of the gift of prophecy being available to the church today, that that in any way, shape, or form involves foretelling. Why would I not be comfortable with foretelling? Well, here's the thing. You either have a completed Bible or you don't. So, if this, just follow my logic here. If God speaks through a written document, or God speaks orally, which method is more authoritative for your life? Be careful how you answer. The one written. Any other answers? Maybe a docu document. Okay, listen to me again. If, that's my if, God speaks through a written document or orally, which one is more authoritative? Exactly, both are. Because yeah. it's God speaking. So you can't say, oh, if he wrote it, it's more authoritative than if he spoke it. Both authoritative. So, um, in order to get around this, some modern prophets will speak of first class and second class revelation. And they'll say, oh, well, first class revelation is the Bible, but we're delivering second class revelation. Really? If God is actually speaking through you, line by line, then every word that comes out of your mouth is as binding upon the people of God as the book of Isaiah, the gospel of Matthew, Lamentations. If it's really from God. So the problem with those that believe that they are communicating ongoing revelation I think it's a, a word game to say it's first class, second class. It's equally authoritative. So you either have a closed canon of scripture or you don't. That's the only conclusion you can arrive at. If you, so if Jack, I'll pick on Jack, because yeah. I've known him for a long time and he can handle it. So if Jack's like, I got a word from the Lord for you, whatever comes out of his mouth, if that's true, is as authoritative as anything I've ever read in the word of God. So the question is, do we live in an age where God continues to offer divine special revelation to his people through prophets? I don't think so. I think the Bible is sufficient and complete. However, I have no problem with someone policing what God has already said. And if you want to call that prophetic utterance, totally cool with that. So there are, there are people that are better at policing what God has said than some other people are. I would like to think that there are prophetic dimensions to my teaching ministry. And then I'm calling the people of God back to covenantal faithfulness to God's <laughs> revealed word. Um, but just keep that in mind as you 
you don't have to share my opinion on that to be my friend. But just kind of think about that for a little bit. That one of the biggest glitches in the modern, all oh, there's still prophets running around on par with whoever in the Bible, is that they should acknowledge that everything they say is actually as authoritative as the 66 books of the Bible. I, I don't see any way you can get around that. And right? if you're actually speaking from God. So here's some tips then. We're just going to kind of shift here. Here's some tips. I got seven of them for studying prophecy. So I want to study Isaiah. I want to, I want to study Ezekiel. What are some things you would recommend that I do to help me plumb the depths of that book? Here's the first one. It applies to all, it applies to all books of the Bible. Few people do it unless they're little itty bitty tiny books like Jude. <laughs> it doesn't even have one chapter. It just is its own chapter. It's a really good idea if you're going to do an extensive study of any prophetic book or if you've just, you haven't spent enough time in it that you don't understand the macro. If you don't understand the macro, what are you going to do? It's like, here's a three page love, love letter. I'm going to start on paragraph eight. And it says, I hate your guts. I never want to see you again. And you didn't read the quote before that said, someone told me this recently. <laughs> so you got to read the context, right? So the first tip is read the prophecy in one sitting. Read the prophecy in one sitting. Now, I know that's going to be hard if you're sitting down and reading Isaiah or Ezekiel. No excuse with the minor prophets. You can read those in one sitting, no problem. You're going to study, I'm going to do a study of Hosea. So you sit down for an hour or an hour and a half or two hours or, I don't know, some people, I'm not a fast reader. I'm a very thorough reader. But some people are like really fast at reading. And so it might take you more time or less. But just sit down, start in chapter one and read right through it. Just get, look at, get the macro sense of the book. That's a really good tip. Secondly, oh, by the way, I would say whenever I preach from books of the Bible, which I always do. Um, whenever I preach systematically through <coughs> books of the Bible, or I'm starting a new one, if I had never read that book before, and I've read them all, so I don't have to do this, but if I had never read that before, or if I haven't been there for a long time, I will sit down and I will read through it, even if I'm just skimming through it. Now, I always preach in, pretty much always in series, so right now we're in Revelations. So I've already like in an afternoon, maybe two afternoons, I kind of like read, did like a quick read through it, and that's where I divided it up into sections and put a heading on it in my, my uh, subject, right? Just because I preach from a sermon calendar. So I kind of get the macro view. And then uh, you can start to, to dissect it. So this is just broad. First one is broad uh, principles, read it in one sitting. Secondly, Identify whether it's a former prophet or a latter prophet. So the former prophet's going to be more narrative, and a latter prophet's going to be more oracle. Then it's really helpful, too, to identify the historical period that it was written in, and if you can, the context. So this is where you can go to commentaries, or if you have a good study Bible, they often have a little intro there, a few, few paragraphs from a scholar. When was this written? What was going on? Was this written to like a rebellious people? Was it written to the northern kingdom from a southern prophet? Because they weren't doing what the southern, prof southern kingdom was doing? What was the circumstance? So broad strokes would be like, is it pre-exilic? Is it exilic? Is it post-exilic? That'll help you. Because if it's pre-exilic, what are some of the curses you're probably going to hear? You're going to get plucked from the land. God's going to send his enemies in. You better watch out. He's coming. He's on his way. If it's exilic, what are you going to hear a lot of? You're returning. Blessings. You're going to come back. The Lord's not forsaken you. This is why I like Daniel's kind of an encouraging book. It's like, oh, man. But the reason why, the reason why you have Daniel is because they didn't listen to the prophets that came before him. 
But now they're in captivity and they're struggling and they've been humbled and God's like, okay, still love you. Hey, check this out. I can take down Nebuchadnezzar. Check this out. I'll do it again. I'll take down um, Belshazzar. I'm still in charge. It's more hope-filled. Post-exilic. Hey, we're rebuilding. We're rebuilding. It's coming along. Things are going well. A lot of talk about the coming of the Messiah. So the historical context will help. Fourth, try to determine what major issue is being addressed. Like what's the sin that was committed that caused the prophet to react? So is it idolatry? There's a lot of those situations. Is it idolatry? That's pretty common. Is it just fors forsaking the law, not loving God? And Malachi is a section there on abandoning the wife of your youth. What's the circumstance, the major issue that the prophet was addressing? So using Hosea as an example, what would you say is the major issue that Hosea was addressing? Spiritual idolatry. Oh, sorry, spiritual adultery, which is idolatry. <laughs> so exactly. So Hosea and his wife and his children become an extended metaphor of that very act. And God's like, hey, does it, does it kind of hurt when your spouse cheats on you? Yeah, it kind of hurts me too when you're unfaithful to me. So what's the major issue? Identify, let me give you three words, a lawsuit, a woe, and a promise. A lawsuit, a woe, and a promise. Why I've suddenly switched to lowercase letters, I have no idea. Um, a lawsuit, so these are the form these are the forms that the prophetic utterances take. It's a case against Israel. So the prophet will write almost as if he's a prosecutor and he's bringing his case against Israel. This I have against you, says the Lord. You have forsaken, you know, and he kind of gets into it. It's like, that's how it's framed up. It's a lawsuit. A woe is a prediction for doom, for doom. This is what's gonna come, I'm gonna take you out. Or a promise, this is a promise for something good. Good is on the way, God hasn't forsaken you. God, this is like Daniel, Daniel's uh, not a lawsuit uh, prophecy, it's not a woe, it's a promise. So identify that, that'll just help you to see the shape of the message. Then six point would be identify the blessings or cursings, and you can cross-reference those back to the Deuteronomy passages or Leviticus passages we've looked at. And then you would wanna do any necessary word studies that would help you to uncover the meaning of like metaphors or expressions or that kind of thing. This isn't a course in biblical hermeneutics. So we're not teaching on like how to do word studies. We do that in other courses. But I, if you would like, okay, I'm gonna have, I need at least five hands to go up to make this worthwhile. If five hands don't go up, we're gonna skip it. Would it be helpful for me to take like a few minutes to talk about how to do a word study? One, two, three, four. Oh, okay, wait, we got our five. Okay, so this is what you do. Pick a word you wanna study. In the, whatever, Old Testament, New Testament, don't care. Pick a word, something meaty, beefy, maybe with multiple meanings. Salvation. Okay, salvation, we'll do that. Okay. Real quick, don't know the context, the word salvation's there. What are some possible ways that the word salvation can be used? In English. Uh, rescue. Check. 
could be in the eternal sense or in the temporal mm -hmm. sense. Eternal, temporal. Anything else come to mind? Let's just go with that. If you're talking about eternal or temporal, you could get into like who's the source of it, all that kind of stuff. So if this is your word, what you would do if you want to do extensive, an extensive word study, you'd first of all ask yourself, am I in the Old Testament or am I in the New Testament? Because you got an English word. And the English word in the New Testament is translated from some Greek word or several Greek words. And the Old Covenant, Old Testament scriptures is going to come from an Aramaic word or 99% of the time from a Hebrew word. So what testament am I in? So now what you would do is a simple word study, which gives you a bit of accuracy, but not a lot. You would look up all references using your concordance to the word salvation in the New Testament. And you would, you would especially pay attention to the way it's used by the particular author that wrote the book you're in. So if it's Paul, you're at an advantage because you could look at all of his writings and look at all the contexts to determine how does Paul use the word salvation. And you might discover he, he always uses it the same way. Or he uses it like with two or three different shades of meaning. And you come up with like three different potential conclusions. And then you would deductively determine like, is this the one that best suits this passage? Is he talking about eternal salvation or is he talking about like some sort of a temporal rescue in this passage? If you, you could do the same thing for the Old, Old Testament. If you want to be a little more precise, actually a lot more precise, what you would do is you would take out a concordance. It's good to own one, but there's lots online. You can take out a concordance. You would look up the usage of that word in the verse you're reading. You would go to your concordance, look up the word salvation, and you'd scroll down the list of all the different uses of the word salvation in the New Testament, and you'd find your verse in that list. And you go over to the right. It'll be a little number. And that number will take you to the back of the concordance, which will tell you what Greek or Hebrew word that is translating. And then you forget about the English. You go to the back. And let's say it's from the word soter. Okay? So then, now I know that in my verse, the Greek word behind this word is soter. Now I'm curious what the word soter means. I don't care about English because the guy might have mistranslated it. Now I'm going to go to my concordance. Let's just say I'm going to make this up. Let's say the number of the concordance is 4133. I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to look down the list, and I'm going to look at all the numbers, and I'm going to circle all the ones, and it might be only a couple. It might be every one. I use 4133, 4133, three, right? All the way down. Because there might be other words, 5296, that is translated into English as salvation, but it's a different Greek or Hebrew word. I'm going to look up all these references now, okay? And now what I have, I may discover as I'm opening my Bible, oh, there's the word rescue. There's the word temporal protection, whatever it might be. I'm making this up. What I know now as I'm reading these is behind those English words is the word soter in every one of those contexts. And then what that tells me is based upon those English translations is it gives me an idea of the range of meaning that a Greek word can have or the range of meaning that a Hebrew word can have. What I mean by that is that some words have a very specific meaning most words have what we call a range. In linguistics, we call it a semantic range or a semantic domain. People are like, that's just semantics. Yeah, it is, and that's kind of important. Semantics are very important, especially when it comes to biblical studies. Because a word can have a broad range of meaning. It can have six, seven, eight totally different definitions. Or it can have like some overlapping definitions. So some examples would be, here's the classic examples, a cattail. 
that can mean a bull rush. That can mean the appendage on the end of a feline. That can mean a whip. Those are three very different things, but it's all C-A-T-T-A-I-L. That's a, a diverse range of meaning, right? Then we have grammatical ranges of meaning. Do you know how many m different ways you can use the word of? There's about 30 or 40 different usages, uses of the word of in the Greek New Testament. And uh, not to get like super technical, but I'll give you a couple examples. If I say, I would like to give you a bowl of wax. What am I offering you? Am I? Am I? I might be offering you a bowl made of wax. I might be offering you a bowl that contains wax. That little word of can be a genitive of substance or a genitive of content. So this can kind of get a little technical, right? But God uses words to communicate to us. And most of the time, we don't get hung up if we kind of get something a little bit wrong. But sometimes there's theological doctrines that can be go up or down, sideways, based upon how you interpret an of, a genitive, a possessive in a, a passage. So it's kind of important. I remember in Greek class, I went through, like, you had to memorize all these things. Like, unbelievable. I never knew there was this many. <laughs> but when you start to think about this, it actually helps you to read more precisely. And you, go, you get all technical, and then you just come back, and it becomes a little more intuitive. So basically what you're doing in a nutshell is you're cross-referencing. You're cross-referencing. Don't just let this passage speak for itself. Go find other passages that use that word, and that will help you to understand better how this word probably is being used. You still might be stumped, but it'll help. If you, um, just one other point, one of the things that we do when we write commentaries. Have you guys ever read a commentary? So it's like uh, you're studying Romans, and you can buy commentaries that scholarly people have written on every verse. And some of them are very technical. Some of them are a little more middle of the road. And some of them are more like almost like sermons. So the sermon ones aren't super helpful because go listen to sermons for that. But the ones that are more expositional or exegetical, if you want to do a deep study in a book, buy like three or four. And let's say you're in Romans 3.10. Read what this guy says in Romans 3.10, this guy and this guy. And what you'll, what you'll do is you'll bring to the surface issues that they might be disagreeing on or debating between themselves. So you might say, oh, this guy has a different opinion on this than this guy and this guy. Maybe there's three different views, or maybe two guys hold this view and one holds this view, or maybe they're all, all like-minded. We raise the issues. Then you determine what is the nature of the issue. Is it a disagreement about geography? Is it a disagreement about authorship? Is it a disagreement about a theological matter? Is it a disagreement about a grammatical issue? Is it a disagreement about the meaning of a word? Is it a disagreement about the original audience? Like what is the nature of the disagreement? And then depending on what the nature of the disagreement is, you go to your other tools to figure it out. So if it's a, it's a geographical thing, you go read some Bible atlases. If it's a theological disagreement, you go and read some systematic theology books. If it's a disagreement about a Bible custom, you go read some Bible customs. I see one right there on the shelf, a handbook on Bible customs right behind uh, Susie and yeah, right in that corner there. So you, you, you identify the issue, you isolate the issue, and you go and you find the resource that helps you to clear up the nature of that issue. And then you could still be wrong, but at least you're responsibly wrong, <laughs> rather than irresponsibly wrong. All right? So that's it for the prophets.